wonderful to see all of you here this morning. Welcome to Pilgrim Congregational Church, United Church of Christ. We are delighted that you chose to be with us this morning as we join in community together to share our joys and concerns, to fellowship and to worship God that we believe is still speaking and to discern what insight and meaning there might be in that ancient wisdom for us today. Just as we are experiencing the change of seasons from fall to winter, we are also nearing the end of the season of, the season is called the season after Pentecost, or ordinary time in the church year. It's not called ordinary time because it's basic or unextraordinary but rather because it's ordinal, it's counting, basically. We're counting the weeks after Easter until the beginning of Advent, when the church year begins again. And in fact, while this time may seem ordinary, great spiritual growth can be found in this downtime between major seasons, when we allow ourselves to rest, renew, before the big celebrations begin, we can find ourselves moved and shaped by the Holy Spirit, challenged by God's word, and called into action by Jesus' example. Now next Sunday is the last Sunday in this season, and we will be celebrating with a special worship service downstairs in Fellowship Hall. So when you come next week, don't come to the front door, go to the side door, the usher will be out there, and you'll go downstairs in Fellowship Hall. Instead of sitting in pews, we will be gathered at tables and will participate in a simple agape meal or love feast as we share some final reflections on the life of Christ and prepare once again to celebrate and anticipate his birth. I hope that you'll join us for this different but hopefully inspiring worship experience. But back today, thank you for coming. It's good to be here with you. Let us worship our God.
dream big. Would you be rich? Famous? What about happy? Now, extend this dream to your friends and family. What would the perfect future look like for all of you together? What about the world? What would the perfect future for humankind and the earth look like? Our scripture reading today is the prophet Isaiah's vision for the possibility for a new future arising from the ruins the people of Judah found in Jerusalem when they returned home after years in exile. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice. Be glad and rejoice. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy. Yes, as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it, or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days. Or an old person who does not live of a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered a curse. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. I will answer. I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer, says the Lord. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Imagine the prophet Isaiah walking through the destruction of Jerusalem. Perhaps calling to mind some of the images We've seen recently of the embattled areas of Syria near the Turkish border might help you relate to the scene of today's text. Much of the city was still in ruin, including homes and markets, and many people continued to suffer the effects of oppression and dislocation despite no longer living in exile. They had returned to Jerusalem excited and full of joy about coming home to their own land. Finally, after two generations of living in a foreign land in captivity. But it's, it's been several years, actually decades, since their return. And much has been accomplished, walls have been erected, and the temple has been rebuilt but it's only a pale shadow of the one that the Babylonians destroyed many years earlier. And much of the city is still in rubble. The people have lived through a number of difficult years, in some respects more difficult even than their years in exile. Hunger, thirst, illness, and early death, sorrow and grief, economic injustice and political turmoil were the realities of the day. They must have been wondering if this patched together Jerusalem was the full measure of their inheritance. Was this what they had survived for? To live like this? 
Was this God's intent, God's wish for them? Their reality bore little resemblance to their dreams, their high hopes for a return to normal, to good old days. Those hopes had been crushed. And I imagine it would have been tempting for them to give up their dreams and accept the new normal, just learn to cope with the way that things were. Because the city they had yearned for, cried over, and prayed that they would someday return to, turns out to be a pile of rubble covered with weeds. What's the use of hoping if you're just going to be disappointed? What's the use of standing against systems and powers and principalities? Because after all, they have all the power. That's why they're called the powers. And yet, the people were still hungering for a word of hope. And it's against this backdrop that Isaiah speaks a vision from God who in the midst of human suffering and despite a long wait is about to do a new and great thing. God promises to create new heavens and a new earth. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating, for I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. Isaiah boldly proclaims that God is creating new heavens and a new earth. God is not just promising to renovate or refurbish as if Jerusalem is an old house and God's a fixer-upper. The mention of creating new heavens and a new earth takes us back to the opening chapters of Genesis, where, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And with each act of creation, God pronounced creation good. God is promising to inject something new into the cultural, political, and economic life of the nation. There have been hard times, political upheaval and collapse, economic uncertainty and food insecurity, and many have given up dreams for a positive future for their nation or their personal lives. But still, there is the potential for hope. And God's vision of the future creates new possibilities and activates the energy to achieve them. Now importantly, God's vision is specific, measurable, and relevant, which enables people to believe that it is achievable. But equally important is that it is not time-based, which is to say that it fails the test of being a smart goal. Because God's time is not our time. And in fact, this vision from Isaiah speaks from God isn't a goal or even a destination. It's a dream. Or given this time of year, I like to think of it as God's Christmas wish for the world. Jim Wallace, the theologian, political activist, and founder of Sojourners Magazine, tells this story from some years ago of volunteering in a church homeless shelter around Christmas time. The church basement was decorated with banners and Christmas decorations. Good news, Christ is born. Glory to God in the highest, and so on. One of the men who lived each day on the streets looked around the room and asked, what is the good news anyway? Jim said there was a long pause and no one knew what to say. Finally, someone spoke up from the back of the line. The good news is it doesn't have to be like this. God is still at work in the world and God needs our creative companionship, our imagination and our talents our heads, our hearts, and our hands. The point of Christian faith is what Archbishop Desmond Tutu calls God's dream, that God is working in this world toward a day when justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When, war, when 
Nations will le not learn war anymore, and when we will see the end of cruelty and suffering in the world. It is a dream of a whole new world where all people and even all of nature are filled with God's love, God's freedom, God's joy, and God's life. Every Sunday when we as a community pray the prayer we have been taught, the Lord's Prayer, we are affirming our desire, our longing for this dream to become a reality. When we pray, thy kingdom come, this is what we're asking for. Today's text is effectively a description of God's kingdom, not so much geography of what it will look like, but the joy and delight that will be part of it, what it will feel like. Although we pray this prayer often, it's likely difficult for us to imagine because as the prophet Isaiah says, it will be something completely new and different from anything anybody could possibly envision. But to be honest, I think the biggest challenge to us imagining this fulfillment of God's wish for us and for the world is that it's so easy to get worn down from the seemingly constant barrage of bad news and the fear of even worse news to come. Whether it's on the global, national, or local level, on big screens, little screens, podcasts or radio programs, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or dare I say it, even face to face, there appears to be more turmoil than peace, more despair and disappointment than delight, more pain and suffering than contentment, more inequity than justice. Like those folks long ago in Jerusalem, we are still living in the in-between times, the gap between our world and God's will for the world. And the gap is not a comfortable place to be. It can be tempting to retreat into reality and just cope. Our other option, and really the only option that has any hope of a better future, is to lean in and act our way towards the world God imagines. It doesn't have to be like this. Of course, leaning in has its challenges and costs. We are called to do justice, practice radical hospitality and compassion, to speak truth to power. Sometimes, that may mean willingly putting ourselves in uncomfortable situations, emotionally, perhaps even physically. We may be criticized for not being a team player, ostracized as proponents of incivility, when the privilege call for civil discourse as a means of silencing points of view that threaten their status. We may risk losing something that is personally of value or important to us, a friendship that we've outgrown, a business opportunity or job that seems otherwise perfect. But the sneakiest, biggest hurdle may be that often our efforts seem to go unrewarded. More negative comments than likes or thank yous barely perceptible positive impact on the problem at hand. It is truly an act of faith to take a risk with no promise of immediate reward, especially in our culture. Living into God's promise can be countercultural and definitely challenging, but be assured it does make a difference. That vision of the future is also what shapes our living in the world in the present. It encourages us to look up from and beyond our current worries to create big, bodacious, impossible goals and then work diligently to achieve them. Maybe only one small step at a time, but at least we're moving forward and we have something to look forward to. 
Even as we live in the gap, we are empowered to make tomorrow better than today. Good things can happen when we lean in to co-create the future God envisions. Medical research and technological advances have led to global decreases in infant mortality rates and increases in average life expectancy. In fact, global average life expectancy increased by five and a half years between 2000 and 2016, the fastest increase since the 1960s. Globally, there's currently the lowest prevalence of extreme poverty, and agencies are actually working together to share best practices with the hope of achieving the goal of ending extreme poverty completely by 2030. Closer to home, there has been a decades-long trend of decline in murders and property crimes, and although the de decreasing crime numbers are of little comfort to families impacted by violence, we can find a glimmer of hope in the encouraging trend that the numbers of murders and shootings in Chicago is down more than 10% this year. Still far too many, but moving in the right direction. And while it is a shame that even that this is even a designation that needs to exist, we can rejoice that Chicago was recently recognized as the most immigrant-friendly city in America because the city has created an inclusive legal environment and adopted policies supporting undocumented immigrants and DACA recipients. There are still opportunities, of course, to improve in providing access to affordable housing and income inequality, such is the tension of living in the gap between what is and what should be. The prophet Isaiah reassures us that neither our nightly news nor the struggles of the day is the measure of all things. In the time in which we live, suffering and justice may seem to be all conquering, but in God's measure of things, joy, delight, and justice will prevail. Thy kingdom come, we say. Believing, knowing, acting as if it will. Let it be sound.